Bless you, Prophetess. Good to see you. Thank you, Jesus. And bless you, Sister Allen. Good to see you. Amen and bless the Lord. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. We're already running a bit late and I do apologize. But I tell everybody and anyone who knows me, they know that I am mommy before I am apostle. So tonight we had to go to the high school and begin setting our schedule for next year for my upcoming freshman. So um, that always takes precedent over anything else and then my next ministry is to the body amen so if you would go ahead and turn with me to uh, the gospel of Luke I want to go ahead and walk out a few things tonight and hopefully give some clarity and then we'll be in a better place amen so let's look to the Lord God we love you tonight and we bless you we honor you for being God and we thank you for saving us. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you, God, for looking beyond everything that we do say and think and seeing right to the heart of our needs. Thank you for being our way maker. Thank you, Jesus, for being our burden bearer. Thank you, God, for being the lifter up of our heads. Thank you for meeting us in our quiet times. And thank you, God, for just being the sound that we need to hear. Tonight, God, I pray that your anointing would ride on this live like it hasn't done in times past, that you would speak to our hearts, God, that we might find ourselves in the scriptures, that we might find ourselves in the scripture, God, and choose to do better. Now, God, sanctify my words, sanctify those things that come out of my heart and even the motive of what I say, and put, allow your spirit of influence to ride on my words that your people may leave better off than we were when we came. It is so in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen, saints. Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 13 tonight. Luke chapter 4. Good evening. Uh, Carolyn, good to see you. Melba, good to see you. Everyone that I have not spoken to. Good to see you all tonight. The scripture that we're going to look at tonight is Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning the first 13 verses. I want to take just a few minutes to try to uh, iron out, like I said earlier, a few things so we can see what God is saying tonight. Luke chapter 4 says this, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. 
Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. Wow. The word of God says that after Satan had ended every possible temptation he departed from him until a more opportune time tonight i want to talk about what is your confession amen what is your confession i want to start, look at the vantage point tonight or start from talking about um lent we know or those of us that um that follow that particular tradition know that the Lenten season started on yesterday. It started um, from uh, yesterday until, which was um, February 22nd, until April the 6th, which is actually Holy Saturday. What happens during that time is that it is 40 days of sacrifice. It is 40 days of the Christian faith saying, that we are going to mimic the sacrifice, the enduring sacrifice of Jesus in the wilderness. I know there are a lot of, of religions that say, you know, well, you're wrong for only doing it 40 days. You know, we're supposed to sacrifice our life as a life of sacrifice. This is true. But these particular 40 days in particular are set aside to remember the sacrifice that Jesus suffered in the wilderness. The Lenten season is a time of preparation for resurrection. Are you hearing me? It is a time of preparation for resurrection. So that means this, that you, we are tempted in the wilderness only to go to the cross. My God. We are tempted in the wilderness only to go to the cross so that we can get to a place called resurrection. Are you with me? Uh, this Lenten season, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to mortify the flesh. That means during these 40 days, we're supposed to sacrifice something that is going to mortify, which means to kill the flesh. These 40 days are a time of deep repentance of sin. Not just that regular stuff, you know, God forgive me for this. No, this is when we go and we lay our supplication before God and we let him know, you know, God, I, I didn't know that this was a sin. I didn't know that when I harbored this thing against that sister, I didn't know that this was a sin. This is a time of deep repentance. And it is also a time of self-denial. It's a time where we decide, okay, I'm going to pull away from one thing in particular. And however much time I would have given to that thing, I'm going to lay it all down and I'm going to search the heart of God. You'll hear people say, well, I gave up Pepsi or I gave up fast food or I gave up sugar. And, you know, and during that time, you spend intense time with the Lord. The rules for Lent, for the Lenten season, again, is that we fast from something. From Ash Wednesday through Holy Saturday, not including Sundays, it is 40 days that leads up to the resurrection. 
So today I want to deal with what is your confession? What are you enduring so that you can prepare for your resurrection? What are you going through? What are you willing to be challenged in so that you can prepare for your resurrection? Then the question becomes, what is it that you want to be resurrected to? What is it that you know has been lying dead and dormant in your life that you've been believing God to speak life to, but you got so busy doing everything else that you overlook the fact that this thing needs to be resurrected. If the truth be told and as quiet as it's kept, oftentimes we stay so busy in the body doing nothing that we never get to the point of resurrection. Anybody ever feel like you're always in the wilderness going through a test? You're always in the wilderness going through something and it seems like you can't get up from one thing before you are introduced to another test. You can't get up from that thing before something else almost tries to suffocate you while, you while you're going into another test. What is your confession? What is your confession when you're going through these tests? Because these tests are, are designed to cause us to have endurance on the way to the resurrection. These tests are designed to determine what our confession is going to be on the way to resurrection. These tests are designed to see where we are in him on the way to resurrection. God bless you, prophet. But we can never get to the place of resurrection if we don't first go through the wilderness. If we don't first go through the enduring portion of the wilderness. If we're not first tried in the wilderness and passed the wilderness test, then we will never be able to have the strength and stamina to endure the cross leading to the resurrection. I understand that everybody gets happy in the resurrection. Everybody gets glad because Jesus got up from the grave and that's something to shout about. But everything that he had to endure leading up to that, he is our model for suffering. He is our model for going through. So when the Christian faith sets aside this Lenten season and they say that, that we're going to mortify our flesh, we're going to kill our flesh for these next 40 days, what they're saying is, I'm going to live like Jesus. I'm going to be okay with suffering what he suffered. I'm going to be okay with going through the wilderness experience because I want to get to resurrection. I need some things in my life to live. I need some people in my life to be healed, delivered, and set free. I need to make some better choices in my life. And in order for that to happen, I got to go through the wilderness experience. I got to check my confession while I'm going through the wilderness experience. I told you that earlier tonight that we were at the high school preparing to choose classes for my oldest child uh, next year. And some of his friends were choosing uh, CP classes and some were in honors and some were in AP. And he looked at me and he said, mommy, I, you know, I'm really good at math. I can do honors. I can do honors. And I told him, I said, Thomas, in order for you to be able to do these things, you have to prove yourself. He said, all of a sudden, it was like the wind had been let out of him. And he said, mommy, I know I'm not good at anything and I can't this and I can't that. I said, Thomas, here's the thing. You are whatever you confess. That's for somebody tonight. You are whatever you confess. If you don't believe that you're going to be able to pass this wilderness test, then you won't. If you don't believe that you're going to be able to handle the cross, then you won't. If you don't believe that you're going to make it to resurrection, then you won't. Because whatever you say is what you can have. And I told him, I don't doubt that you can make it in honors classes. I don't doubt that you can make it in AP classes. But the problem is you've got to prove yourself where you are. And he says, well, mommy, you know, I'm good at math. I said, here's the thing. You're average at math. In order to move to the next level, you have to move from average to exceptional. In order to move from where you are to where you want to be, you got to move from average to the next level. I know you think you're doing the best you can. God bless you, Sister Williams. I know you think you're giving all you can. 
But if you were doing the very best that you could, then your teacher would make the recommendation for the next level. Are you hearing me in the Holy Ghost? Because Satan knew that Jesus was passing every test in the wilderness. He always elevated him to the next level of test. And, and going into the wilderness, the word of God says the first thing is that Jesus had just got finished being baptized. Not only had he just got finished being baptized, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost. So this group of people, this, this body of believers that have taught us wrongly all of these years that you're going through because you lack the Holy Ghost or you're going through because you're not in the right place with God. The word of God says, the written word of God says that Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. Not only that, it said that the Holy Ghost drove him into the wilderness, right? So the Holy Ghost drove him into a dry place so that he could be tempted. Drove him into a dry place so that he could be tempted so that he could prove who he was. God knew who he was, but Jesus needed to prove something in this earth realm. And this is what I was telling my son. I know how great you are. You say you know how great you are. But you have to prove yourself. You can't just show up and say, I'm great. Here I am. I've arrived. Everybody hear me. You have to prove yourself. And the proof happens in the wilderness. The proof happens when you're going through and you really don't deserve to go through. But God said, I got to take you through because you can't just show up at resurrection without going through the wilderness. You've got to go through these 40 days of trial. You've got to go through this valley. You've got to go through these, these things that Satan is going to bring to you. And then i got to check your confession. Not only what comes out of your mouth, but what is in your heart. Is everybody with me tonight? Not only what comes out of your mouth, but what's in your heart. Because so many of us in the body of Christ will confess one thing out of our mouth, but our heart does not line up with what's in our mouth. And then when the battle heats up and when the wilderness is too long and when the enemy is bashing our head, we throw our hands and we give up and we like, OK, God, you know what? I tried. I'm done with it. That's enough for me. I'm walking away. I'm going to lay my religion down. I'm going to cuss them out and I'll try it again tomorrow. God said, that's, that's not a good confession. Matter of fact, that doesn't even speak well of your witness. You are full of the Holy Ghost. So much so that God said, I can trust you in the wilderness experience. I can trust you to endure this experience because your eye is not on the wilderness. Your eye is on the resurrection. My God. Whew, dizzy already. The enemy already pushing back. We plead the blood of Jesus. You know, you don't have your eye on the wilderness. Your eye is on the resurrection. If we kept our eye in our current situation, most of us would never move beyond this. If we kept our eye focused on how bad things really are in the present, most of us wouldn't look, wouldn't move beyond this. We would fold up. We would be like blind Bartimaeus. We're going to sit beside the road. We're going to be like the man at the pool for 38 years. We're going to wait there until somebody helps us get somewhere. When we take our eye off of the resurrection, when we take our eye off of where God is taking us, then we get stuck in the moment. So the word says that he was tempted for 40 days of the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterwards, and when everything had ended, he was hungry. His natural body was hungry. 40 days he was without food and water and he was seeking God and the enemy was tempting him and he was hungry. How many of us know and understand a lot of people have forfeited the birthright and the blessing of God because they were hungry. They could not mortify their flesh. They couldn't kill their flesh. So they sold their flesh. They sold their birthright for the next great move of God. They sold what God had on them for somebody else's platform. They gave up the anointing of God on them because they wanted somebody to call their name. They wanted to be notarized on, on Facebook. They, they wanted somebody to put their name in light so they couldn't go through the wilderness experience. They decided, you know what? If I can move faster by sleeping with somebody, if I can move faster by snorting cocaine with somebody, if I can move faster by letting my wilderness be a lie, then I will, I, I'll, I'll do that. I just want to get to the resurrection. 
whatever it takes, whatever I can skip, whatever I can bypass to get to the resurrection. I just don't want to die here. Can I tell you that it was never God's plan for Jesus to die in the wilderness? He had to go to the cross. He had to get to the resurrection. Why am I saying that? Because no matter what wilderness experiences you and I are going through, and they are many, and they are long, they were never designed for us to die in the wilderness. Our wilderness experiences were never designed for us to throw our hands up and say, you know what, the anointing is not worth it. Our wilderness experiences were not designed for us to look at God and say, God, you chose the wrong one. It was not designed for us to say, you know what, well, maybe what everybody said about me in the street was right. Our wilderness experience was not to look back in God and say, God, you know what, I, I think you chose the wrong one. Maybe, maybe you lied. Maybe God, maybe I'm not good enough for this. Our wilderness was never designed to kill us. There was not a house in the wilderness. There was not a family in the wilderness. There was not a tombstone in the wilderness. Every time the enemy came at him, Jesus gave him what he knew. His confession is what the word was. He gave the enemy all he had to fight with. In other words, he said, I'm weak from the battle that I already went through. I'm weak because I've mortified my flesh and those things and people that I would normally lean on. They're not here at this moment. I'm weak. So I'm going to give you what I know. I'm going to give you the word of God. And I know that God is bound by his word. So the word of God says that the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, can I say to you this, that Satan tempted him with who he was. Mm -hmm. Shout right there. I said that Satan tempted him with who he was. He said, if you be the son of God. In other words, he's saying, I know who you are. But do you know who you are? He doesn't tempt us with what we don't already know. He doesn't try to hold anything over our head about what we don't already know. So when God gives us this great vision and this great dream while we're sleeping and we, we get up and we write this great vision down, immediately Satan comes to us and he says, if you are the child of God, if you are the prophet of God, and he really gave you that vision. If you are the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and he really gave you that vision, he said this, he said, command these stones to become bread. He not only told Jesus who he was, but he spoke to the weakness. He told him, you are the son of God, but you're still weak. In other words, he's saying, I see your deity and I see your humanity. Now, whose side are you leaning on? Saints of God, can I say to you, until we get the strength to mortify the flesh until we get the fortitude to kill our flesh. Satan is going to always come back to us and give us the same thing. I know who you are, but this is what you are exhibiting. I know who you are, but this is what your flesh wants. I know who you are, but this is what the people are saying. And we get so bombarded and bamboozled by what the enemy has to say to us. And we get so overwhelmed by what he's saying to us that we don't go into our arsenal, which is the word of God, and tell him it is written. Jesus did not fight with anything that did not have power. My God. I said that he did not fight with anything that did not have power. So he didn't even give him his own name. He said it is written. He gave him the word. He didn't say in the name of Jesus. No, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And immediately in his wilderness experience, he shut Satan down through the first example of, I don't need to more, I don't need to gratify my flesh. I don't need to feed my flesh. I don't need to feed my ego. Because man shall not live by bread alone. I don't need you to tell me I'm beautiful. I don't need you to tell me I'm a great preacher. I don't need you to show up to all my conferences. Why? Because man shall not live by bread alone. I don't need you to pat me on my back. I don't need you to say how great and wonderful I am. I don't need you to, to, to pat my ego because that is bread. That is natural. He said, I need you to 
understand that which I have placed in you, it is spiritual. And this is what you need to eat from, that man shall not live by bread alone. When the bread is gone, then what do you have? When the flesh has been mortified, then what do you have? When you have denied yourself of everything, then what do you have? Jesus said, it's the word. When everything else fails, it's the word. The first test was, if you're hungry enough, I'll feed you. Let's see what I can get her. Let's see what I can give him to give up just because he's hungry enough. My God from Zion. Can I say to you, thanks to God, that if you find yourself eating of the word, then you won't be hungry in your flesh. When you find yourself eating the word, once the enemy comes and he lays this first thing down to you, God going to immediately give you a word to give back to him. It is written. That wasn't good enough for him. The word says, then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. So first he met Jesus where he was in a low place, right? Then he took him up on a mountain and he said this to him. He said, I will give you, or he said, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I will give it to you and to whomever I wish. That not only lets us know that he tried to give the kingdoms of this world to Jesus. He said, but I'll give it to whomever I wish. That means that to this day, Satan is still trying to give the kingdoms of this world over to us. He's still buying the believer with the kingdoms of this world. My God, he's still buying the believer with the kingdoms of this world because our confession has not changed. It has not changed. It, it hurts me when I see the saints of God, the men and women of God that have sold themselves for the kingdoms of this world. When you look at people and you see the anointing of God on them and they're operating out of another spirit and you look and you think, my God, they're operating from the spirit of this world. He came to him. This is the second temptation. And I'm saying it this way for a reason. This is the second temptation. The first one is bread. Are you hungry? The second one is fame and notoriety. I'll give you this because it was given to me. And I can give it to whom I wish. Even from children, all kids want to do is play in the NBA, play in the NFL. They want to be big. They want to have their name in light. Because from an early age, the enemy is trying to feed them. I'll give you this if you give me that. And some of them don't even recognize that they're going to have to give up their entire life to the enemy for saying, I'll do whatever it takes to play professional ball. I'll do whatever it takes to be a music star. And the enemy gets wind of that. And he's like, that's it. That's the kingdom of this world that I was looking for you to say that you wanted. And in a moment of confession, in a moment of our flesh being weak, we give up what God has for us for our name to be in life. As an educator, I can say that I have seen this all 23 years of my education, 24 years of my educational career. Even little kids come in. What do you want to be? Everybody wants their names in life. Because the enemy has tricked so many people into believing this belongs to me and I want to give it to you. Not knowing that sometimes you've got to give up your whole self to walk in that place. Can I bring that to the church? Sometimes there are people that so want to operate in their gift and they're so upset that their local leaders don't use them. They'll let the preacher down the street pimp them out. They'll let the prophet down the street pimp them out because they're angry that their local leader has not elevated them. Not understanding that your local leader knows all of your weaknesses. Your local leader knows your inability to confess the word. Your local leader knows your walk with God. Those people that some of us try to connect to, they don't know who you are. They don't know what breaks you. They don't know why you are who you are. All they know is that you showed up, you wanted a word, they gave it to you, you got happy, and you stayed down there for a little bit. 
they elevated you to a place of notoriety. In other words, you sold yourself to be elevated. God bless you, Pastor. Good to see you. You sold yourself to be elevated. So when Satan told Jesus, listen, all of this was given to me and I can give it to you and whomever I wish if you would just serve me. He says, therefore it is written, you will worship before me and all this, he says, will be yours. Verse eight says, and Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. Praise to God, we, I'm talking about in the house of God, have given up the blessing of God for somebody to call our name prophet, for somebody to label us apostle, for somebody to put us in the fivefold. We have given up, because don't, don't think that there aren't witches and warlocks in the house of God. We have given up who we are in him. We have failed the wilderness test because we needed somebody to affirm who we are. We needed somebody to say, yeah, you know, you, you, you're, the, you're a chief of this or you, you are whatever we got going on, archbishop, whatever all that stuff is. We need somebody to say how great and wonderful we are. In other words, we're saying to Satan, I'm going to go up on that pinnacle and I'm going to worship you. Say to God, what is your confession? God is not pleased with the lukewarmness of our confession. The importance for me for Lit in this year is that we've got to get back to the blueprint of God. We've got to get back to the wilderness experience. we got to get back to the place of God where we give the enemy the written word of God so he backs up off of us. If nobody ever calls my name, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. If you never call me to preach in your church, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only will I will you serve if you never put my name in life. We have to understand the Lord our God is one. And my confession is I will not bow down to another God. I will not serve him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Jesus knew the word. And although he was hungry and he was tempted and he was broken. He found his strength in the word. He understood that all these other things will fade away. Because when you get mad with me, if you elevated me, then you're going to sit me down. When you get mad with me, if I do something that you don't like, then you're going to sit me down. If you elevated me when I'm no longer supposed to be a part of this ministry, you're going to kill my witness and my reputation. But when we learn how to pass the wilderness test, when we come to the place of what we know what our confession is, then when the enemy comes with the bread test, when the enemy comes with the name and like test, we can tell him it is written. Please take note that when Satan came to him and asked him, if you are the son of God, X, Y, and Z, then Satan said, for it is written. Are you hearing me? Satan knew the word and he knew it enough to throw it in Jesus's face. And Jesus was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you're going to mishandle the word, but let me give it back to you the right way. So he told him this. The word of God says he tempted him with bread. He took him to the next level. He tempted him with notoriety. Then he took him to the third level. The word says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle, which was the highest point in Jerusalem. And then he said this to him. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Isn't that Satan? He'll get you by yourself. He'll get you depressed. He'll make you mad with the church folk. He'll make you mad with your husband and your wife. He'll make you angry with your children. He'll get you to a place of isolation. And he'll say, Nobody really loves you. So if you go ahead and kill yourself, it's not going to really matter. Nobody really loves you. So if you go ahead and leave this ministry, it doesn't really matter. Nobody really cares about you. So if you walk away from this thing, it doesn't really matter. But this is what he says. For it is written. This is Satan talking to Jesus. For it is written. 
he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. In other words, Satan said, go ahead and jump. Because if you are the son of God, they're going to catch you anyway, right? Anyway, the enemy tells us, go ahead and try it. Because even if you fall, God going to forgive you anyway. Go ahead and commit fornication and adultery. Because God going to forgive you anyway, right? Go ahead on and become a liar in your heart. Because God going to forgive you anyway, right? Go ahead and don't pay your tithes. God know your heart because he's going to forgive you anyway. He gives us just enough to skirt by the truth. Not letting us know that if we lay in that lie, then God is going to meet us in that place. He said, go ahead and jump. Jump from this place. Because if you are who you say he, you are, he's going to catch you. Go ahead and sin. Because if you are who you say you are, he's going to forgive you. Go ahead and do whatever egregious thing you want to do. Because if you are who you say in him, he's going to cover you anyway. Say to God, we have to understand that Satan brings absolutely nothing new to us. He doesn't tempt us with anything that Jesus was not already tempted with. These 40 days of Lent brings it back into perspective. It brings it back to a place where you look and say, wait a minute. If Jesus can pass the wilderness test and he was in his humanity, if Jesus' confession is the word and he was in his humanity, if Jesus never bowed his knee to Satan and he was in his humanity, then what is wrong with me? If Jesus' confession is what the word said, then what's wrong with me? If his eye was on the resurrection, then what's wrong with me? If he trusted God in the wilderness, then what's wrong with me? I was talking to a pastor today. And I was saying to her, I said, from my observation, the biggest issue with the body is nobody has any stamina. Nobody can put up with anything. You can't correct anybody. You can't set anybody straight. You can't rebuke anybody. You can't tell anybody their skirt too short. You can't tell the men their pants too tight. You can't tell this one that hair doesn't suit you. You can't tell a mother you need to be home with your children. You can't tell a husband you need to treat your wife better because everybody is offended by everything. You can't correct the body because the body already thinks it's straight. I told him, I said, Pastor, I said, here's the thing. You can't feed somebody that thinks they're already full. You can't teach someone that thinks they already know. And we are living in a time when blood-bought believers know so much that you can't teach them anything. They know so much that when they go through their wilderness experiences, they don't even know how to get out of them. But the moment that you rebuke them, then it's church hurt. The moment that you tell them that's not the desire for God for your life. All of a sudden, well, you, you know more about my life than me. God going to speak to me first. Thanks to God. Your confession is not what God would have you. If you cannot make it through the wilderness test, you will never get to the resurrection. If you can't go to the through the barren places, then you'll never be able to live in the places flowing with milk and honey. If you can't be rebuked, when you're in a place where God is trying to train you, then you'll never be able to stand in the place that God really wants you to be. But the body, the kingdom of God, the saints of God, the church of Jesus Christ has gotten so weak in our witness. We, you may as well say, man, I know I'm talking right. We've gotten so weak in our ability to fight. We've gotten so weak in our ability to fast and pray. We've gotten so weak in our ability to go through the wilderness and not bow our knee to say we've gotten so weak that whatever comes, we just bow to it. That whatever people say, we just submit to it. 
This is what the word of God says, that there will become a time, there will come a time, brother, when folk will not endure sound doctrine, but they're going to have itching ears. In other words, you're not going to want to go through the wilderness. You want to go over here to this church to say, name it, claim it, turn the circle three times and God going to give it to you. You want to go over here where they say, give them the $5,000 prayer line. We're going to give you a word and God going to bring it to pass. And if it doesn't, if he doesn't, it's not because I gave you a wrong word. It's because you didn't line up with what God said, but make sure the $5,000 check clear. We're living in a, in a time where nobody wants to be sanctified and set aside for kingdom. They want to do kingdom. But we don't want the wilderness. We want to get the resurrection. But we don't want the crucifixion. We want the glory of the third day. But we don't want to go through day one and two. Jesus had to endure all of this before he ever started ministry. Oh God from Zion. Before he was ever able to do a miracle. Before he was ever able to call the disciple. Before he was ever able to raise Jerry as his daughter, he had to go through the wilderness. He had to prove what was in him. Say to God, what are you proving? What's in you? Jesus said this. And Jesus answered in verse 12 and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God, my Lord. What's in you, saints? What is your confession? What is it that God is trying to stir up in you to be able to have enough stamina to stand in the next place? Everything can't hurt your feelings. Everybody can't be wrong but you. You can't be the only one with the answer. Thanks to God. God is calling us to a place of stamina. He's calling us back to a place of being able to go through. He's calling us back to the wilderness experience where we're able to mortify our flesh where we're able to live in a place called repentance and where we are able to deny our flesh. This is what the word says. When the devil has ended every temptation, I want you to hear that. These are the only three temptations that Satan can bring to you. Whatever we go through, they are all wrapped up in one of these three temptations. He said, now, when the devil had ended every temptation, hear me, the word says he departed from him until a more opportune time. Wow. That literally means that Satan left Jesus in the wilderness after he tried to tempt him, but only for a short time. He said, I'm going to wait until he's weak again. I'm going to wait until he's going through a wilderness experience again. I'm going to wait until he's broken again. And then I'm going to show up to tempt him. I'm going to wait till their money is looking funny. I'm going to wait until their health is in question. I'm going to wait until uh, my husband won't let me look at his phone and then I'm going to tempt him. He never comes when we're strong. He never comes when we're full of joy. He never comes when we're in right standing. According to the written word of God, he always comes when we're in the wilderness. The enemy always fights us when we're in a low place. He always fights us after we have been filled while we are empty. He always comes and he tries to tempt us back to a place when our eyes ought to be set on the resurrection. We ought to make up in our minds, no matter how the enemy tries to tempt me when I'm hungry, 
No matter how the enemy tries to tempt me with fame and notoriety, no matter how the enemy tries to tempt me with isolation, I am going to keep my eye on the resurrection because I know that this temptation was not designed to kill me in the wilderness. I know that this temptation is not unto death. I know that this going through without food right now, it's not going to render me without for always. I know that if I can get through this wilderness, then resurrection is going to be my portion. What's your confession? What are you saying tonight, saints of God? When you, when we are tempted by the evil one, the adversary of our soul. What is your confession? Not your last resort, but what is your confession? Have you passed your wilderness experience? Or are you still hungry in the wilderness? Have you been able to go beyond the wilderness test? Have you met any point of resurrection? Say to God, if you have not, if your testimony is every time I start, I fall. Every time I get up, I fail. I would beseech unto you that you would go back and get a fresh feeling. That you would go back to the place where you met Jesus and get a fresh feeling of the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? The word of God clearly says that the only reason Jesus was able to withstand these temptations is because he was full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not your salvation. The Holy Ghost is not you rolling around on the floor. The Holy Ghost is not you paying your tithe. The Holy Ghost is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is God himself living inside of you that is causing you to make the right choices even when you want to make the wrong. The Holy Ghost is the comforter of God that will come into your life and will not allow you to get so overcome by grief that you lose yourself in yourself. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of God that will give you the word of God back to give to Satan when you find yourself in a battle that seems like you can't fight. The word of God says, after the baptism of Jesus and after he was filled with the Holy Ghost, that the spirit of God drove him into the wilderness. Saints, what's driving you? What has you in that place? Why are you in the wilderness again? What is your wilderness experience strengthening you for? Because you should not just be in the wilderness to be there. My Lord. You shouldn't be in the wilderness just to give testimony about, oh, how oh, I'm, I'm going through, but I'm believing God to bring me out. When you come out of the wilderness, you ought to be stronger. You ought to be more diligent. When you come out of the wilderness, the same things that you tripped up on going into the wilderness, you shouldn't trip up on now that you've come out. The same things that used to hinder you up before you went in the wilderness shouldn't hem you up anymore. What have you learned in your wilderness experience? What strength have you gained in your wilderness experience? What have you been resurrected from once you come out of the wilderness? What's your confession? We oftentimes like to judge what we don't understand. Which is why I ask God, give me an opportunity to talk about the Lenten season and what it's really supposed to be about. So that when we see the Methodist organization who, whose bishop tells them the whole church is going to observe Lent 
and we laugh at them because we don't understand. And some of them may not understand. During the 40 days of Lent, we go through the wilderness. We choose to endure the wilderness. We choose to deny ourselves. We choose to mortify the flesh. We choose to live a life of repentance. And here is the thing. After those 40 days, it should be a lifestyle. After those 40 days, we shouldn't have to wait till Lenten season next year to mortify our flesh for another 40 days. Then it becomes a lifestyle where you say, God, I want to sleep with that man, but I can't. Lord, I want to be with that woman, but I can't. God, I want to get high, but I can't. Lord, I want to cuss somebody out, but I can't. Because once you have mortified your flesh, it no longer lives. Is God talking to anybody? Because everybody real quiet tonight. Is he talking to anybody? Once you mortify your flesh, it can't live again. Once you mortify your flesh in that area, it's dead. This is why this Lenten season shouldn't just be a season. It should be a lifestyle. These 40 days shouldn't be a time where your leader just have to call the church to consecration. You should be going through consecration willingly on your own. Where you look at your walk and you look at your talk and you look at your lifestyle and you say, God, I know this can't be pleasing to you. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to consecrate myself and I'm, and I'm going to pull away. God, how long, how many days you want me to pull away? And I'm going to sanctify myself unto the Lord. God, how many days do you need me to consecrate myself? God, what is it in me needs to die in the wilderness? What is it about me that always falls short of getting to the resurrection? What is it about me where I can't get myself past that one thing that continues to hear me? What is it about me? That every time somebody says something to me, it hurts my feelings. It takes me back five years. God, I need to mortify that thing. I need to kill that thing. That every time something happens, I run to the bottle and get drunk for two or three days a week. And I smoke marijuana and get high until I feel like coming down. God, what is that thing? What is that thing in me that I need to mortify? Show me how to deny my flesh. So when my flesh start rising, I know how to tell my flesh to sit down. Show me how to bring my flesh under submission. Show me how to come out of this wilderness ready for the resurrection. Show me what I need to learn while I'm going through these days of consecration. Show me what's in me that needs to die so the God in me can live. We spend so much time coveting the gifts and the anointing of other people. We don't recognize it happened because of the sacrifice in the wilderness. I remember I used to pray and ask God, I wanted the anointing of Paul. God, I want to be able to walk past people and my shadow get them healed. I want to be able to go past people and hand them pieces of cloth and, and they get healed from the anointing on my life. And God allowed it to happen. But I didn't understand the necessity of going through the wilderness. I didn't know all I was going to have to suffer while I was in the wilderness, to be resurrected to that kind of anointing. I went to a church on Sunday, visit with a pastor friend of mine. And she said these words, they shocked me. She said, Apostle Agnes has been, been doing this for so long. She said that whenever she walks into a room, she demands, she commands authority. She said that she don't even have to say anything. But when she walk in the room, the apostle in her, the spirit of God in her commands the room. And I remember thinking, is that how she sees me? Because sometimes when I walk in the room, I feel like I'm the least likely. Sometimes when I walk in the room, I feel like I'm the lowest one there. When I walk in the room, I'm like, God, don't even have anybody to call my name. I just want to be here to be fed because I've come through so many wilderness experiences. 
My grandma calls them danger seen and unseen. I've come through so much stuff. I'm like, I don't want anybody to recognize me when I walk in the place. But she says, the presence and the power of God on you is so powerful. She said, nobody can't help but see you. And as I was preparing this, the spirit of God said, because you went through the wilderness and you came through the resurrection. You went through what you had to go through and you came through the resurrection. People judged you wrong and you went through the dry place and you came through the resurrection. And they lied on your name and you went through the wilderness and you came through the resurrection. And they talked about you while you was going through a divorce and you went through the wilderness, you came through the resurrection. And they talked about the fact that you don't have but a handful of members and, and you don't have but a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And he said, but you withstood the wilderness. Bless your name, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, you withstood the wilderness. And I was able to anoint you through the resurrection because you passed the wilderness test. Who, Jesus? Because your confession in the wilderness never changed. There's sometimes I'm going through and my oldest son will come and he's like, mommy, you okay? And he'll see me crying and going through things that you all don't see leaders go through. And he's asking me, mommy, are you okay? Mommy, what do you need me to do? Mommy, what's going on? And my answer to him has never changed. Thomas, in everything, I trust God. I don't understand it sometimes, but I trust him. I give my whole heart to people in ministry only for them to turn around and cut my throat. But Thomas, I trust God. I don't care. I, I tell them I don't care how you see them treat me. We are going to trust God. What I'm saying is we're going to pass this wilderness. We're not going to die in this wilderness because this wilderness was not designed for us to die in. Our strength comes after we pass the wilderness test and we make it through the resurrection. Say to God, what is your confession? When you go through the wilderness, what is your confession? God wants to know, can he trust you with the wilderness? Can he trust you to sacrifice just 40 days for consecration? Can he trust you to give up something more than just sugar? Can he trust you to give up something more than just a, a, a soda or, or fast food? Can he trust you to consecrate yourself in a deeper way? Can he trust you to hide yourself behind the cross and say, God, kill everything in me that's not like you? Can he trust you in these next 39 days of Lent to say, God, I am filthy before you and I need you to clean me. I need you to consecrate me because I want to be used in your service. I, don't, I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't need my name on the platform. I just need you to be satisfied. Can God trust you? Can he trust you? And are you willing to go through the wilderness. Praise God, I just want to come on tonight and encourage you. That is Lenten season. It is the time of year that some Christian churches set aside and require that the believers in that organization sacrifice. Sacrifice themselves. And in that time of sacrifice, you fill it with the things of God. You fill it with prayer and consecration. You fill it with reading the word. You get off your phone and you say, for the next four hours, I'm not answering a text. I'm not answering a text message. I'm not answering my phone. But I'm going to bury my head in the heart of God, and I'm going to hear what God has to say. Forty days to a lifestyle change. Forty days to resurrection. Forty days to win the battle of the wilderness. Amen. What is your confession? That's the word of God for the people of God. He is challenging us to get back to consecration. God is challenging us to come back and get in his face, to mortify our flesh, to deny ourselves 
and stay in a place of repentance. God has need of you, but he cannot use you until you mortify your flesh, until you consecrate yourself and go through the wilderness. Can I say this to you, saints of God? That prophetically I say to you, I prophesy to you by way of the Lord God. You're, we're going to begin to notice, and it already is, I hear the Holy Ghost say. We're going to begin to notice a distinct mark between the leaders in the house of God that have been consecrated and passed the wilderness test and those leaders who have not. We're going to begin to see the strength and the power and the fortitude of God sit on those people that consecrate themselves as holy unto God and pass the wilderness test. And then we're going to begin to see this other group of leaders that study just in time for Bible study, that, that go to God just when they need something. God, hear the Holy Ghost say that he is going to begin to allow us to see who is consecrated unto him. He is going to begin to allow us to see his power rest on the one that are sanctified and set aside. And he's going to begin to expose the ones that are hireling. This is why it is important for us to pass the wilderness test. Because for every test passed, a greater measure of the anointing will come upon her life, will come upon your life. And with the greater portion of anointing, God will begin to reveal himself more to you. And the more God reveals himself to you, the more he's going to draw people that need that type of anointing unto you. So the churches that have not, I hear you, Holy Ghost, the churches that have not been growing and people have been laughing at, all of a sudden those ones are going to be the ones that are growing. Because the anointing is going to begin to draw the people. The church that is laced with, with smoke and mirrors is soon to be non-existent. The church that has been, hear me in the Holy Ghost, that has been laced with smoke and mirrors is soon to be non-existent. Because the power and the presence of God is going to fill the temple so that people will begin to leave those ministries looking for this kind of anointing. They're going to leave those temples looking for pastors and leaders that have gone through a thing and have been able to stand, come out of the wilderness, and live through the resurrection. God wants to know, are you willing to be that leader? Is that you? You don't have to be ordained to do that. You don't have to be consecrated and set aside to do that. God is ready to use any willing vessel that will consecrate themselves unto him and pour himself out to those people. It's called the end time push. Where there's going to be a great harvest of souls. And God said, you are going to need to be consecrated. You're going to need the full power and authority of God to deal with some of the demons and some of the lifestyles that's going to wander into your ministry. You're going to need the power of the fresh Holy Ghost to deal with some of the grievances and the molestations and the drug abuses that is going to wander into your sanctuary. But if everybody in the sanctuary is still on milk, and if everybody is still easily offended, and no one is willing to go through the wilderness, those people will come and they will sit in our congregations and they will die there because the anointing is supposed to give them life. Thanks to God, what is your confession? I want to encourage you tonight. Sanctify yourselves wholly unto the Lord. 
and let God use you. Sanctify yourself. So when the enemy comes, you can give him the word. Sanctify yourself. Because when the enemy leaves you, no, the word says he's going to come back at a more opportune time. Sanctify yourself and don't be fooled by the devices of Satan. Pass this test so that you can be strengthened for the next level. Amen. That is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thanks to God, if you are in the Columbia, South Carolina area and the surrounding area tomorrow night, we are having what God is calling a soaking in his presence, a time of individual um, um, intercess, in intercession. It basically amounts to old school tarry service. But we're going to go into the presence of God and we are going to lay our head in the heart of God, and we're going to cry out to God. We're going to cry out to God in prayer. For two hours, we're going to saturate the atmosphere with worship, and we're going to come, and we're going to lay in God. We're going to sit in his lap, and we're going to put everything on him, and when we leave, we're going to be free. We're going to cry out for our nation and our children and ourselves. We're coming to God tomorrow night, and we're going to believe that God is going to answer whatever we lay on the altar. We're going to be at 6801 uh, St. Andrews Road, Irmo, South Carolina, inside Faith Seed Ministries, where the pastor is Dr. Takethea Knight. We are going to go before the presence of God, and we're going to believe heaven. God promised me two things. He said, open heaven and an ascension in the spirit. When you come tomorrow night, expect an open heaven and an, and an ascension in the spirit. God is going to open up heaven over 6801 um, St. Andrews Road tomorrow night. God is going to visit us there. There is going to be an awesome visitation of his spirit. I don't say that to pimp who God is. I say that because that's what he told me. And God is a keeper of his word. Whatever has you bound. Whatever has you broken, whatever you need to be free from, if you just need to come in there and sit in the presence of God, not utter a word, just sit there and soak in his presence, come. If you need to come and lay on your face, come. If you're the one that needs to cry out in a corner somewhere, come. If you need to bring your pillow and a blanket to cover your head in consecration and prayer, come. However you need to get. In the presence of God, he told me to supply the place and bid the people to come. Tomorrow night is your night for soaking in his presence. Tomorrow night is your night for laying it all down to him. If you can't come, I, I, I challenge the leaders to open up your churches in your local area. At the same time, tomorrow night from 730 to 930 and believe God with us. If you can't open up your places of worship right there in your home, open up your heart in the same time frame. Be in agreement with us here in South Carolina that God is going to move on our behalf. He's going to move in the nation. He's going to move in the government. He's going to move in education. He's going to move in finance. He's going to move in your home. He's going to move upon your children. Whatever, however, you need God to move come because we're going to believe God like we never have before. And I just hear the Lord say, and we're going to leave changed. Thank you, thanks to God for being with me tonight and tarrying with me through this Bible study on what is your confession. Go to God. Seek that one thing, those two things, those three things that you need to consecrate unto him. Pass your wilderness test so that you can get to the point of resurrection. Stop going around this same mountain. Pass the test so that you can get to the point of resurrection so that God can trust you with your next place in him. Amen. My prayer is that the, the blessings of God will come from behind you and overtake you, that God will make your enemy your footstool, and he will allow you to see your enemy coming before they get too close. That God will sanctify your heart, your mind, and your thought unto him. It is so.
in Jesus' name. Saints of God, be blessed. Until next time.